Hey YouTube family, listen man, you're about to watch a message. It's the first message in a series I did called Greater. You gotta check it out. It's it's it was recorded at our Atlanta location and uh it's called I Didn't Know It Would Take This Long. If you have ever had to wait on anything or you feel like you're waiting on God now, I want you to tap into this message. Now I'm gonna ask you to do something. It's the only thing I have asked you to do. And that is if it blesses you, just send it to somebody else. That's it. Do that for me. I believe God's going to honor it. Enjoy the message. Of how God's going to end this year. So these next several weeks, we're going to be locked in here. So I want to call your attention to the book of Luke, chapter number one, beginning at verse number five. Uh, Luke, chapter one, verse five. The scripture will be on the screen for those of you in the room and online. It says, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, for your prayer has been heard. Your wife will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth. Listen to verse 15, for he will be great before the Lord. I want to talk from this subject in our time together. I hope you feel like talking back to the preacher today. Here, here's the topic of today's teaching. I didn't think it would take this long. Somebody clap your hands if you believe God's speaking to you already. I didn't think it would take this long. Family, today marks on the Christian liturgical calendar, today marks the beginning of what we call Advent season. The word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, and it simply means coming. Everybody say coming. Therefore, the Advent season is a season where people in people of faith engage in intentional appreciation and celebration for the coming of Jesus. The Easter season is a season that we celebrate him getting up. But the Advent season is a season wherein we celebrate him coming down. And I want to interrupt this introduction today and announce we should be uniquely appreciative of the Advent season because the Advent season is a season that reminds us that he is not just the God who came, he is the God who comes. And you will not properly appreciate his coming unless you've been in a season where you felt like he was going. And I know there are many of you who are in this room and watching online who always feel uniquely intimate and close with God. You know he's always near and dear to you. But there are some of us who have gone through some seasons of life where we were like Jesus stretched out on a proverbial cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In other words, some of us have gone through some seasons where cognitively we know God is there, but experientially we like God where you at I know you see what's happening where you at I know you know the first is coming up where you at I know you see what they're doing to me where are you at is there anybody honest enough to admit there have been some times where you've wondered where are you but the Advent season is a season that reminds us that God is not just Elohim which means God. He is Emmanuel, which means God with 
us. He isn't the God who came. He's the God who comes. He's the God who only exists in the present tense. So when Moses asked him to identify himself, he didn't say I was and he didn't say I will be. He says I am. I am what I am that I am. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. He is the God that didn't just show up. He's the God that shows up. And the incarnation is a revelation that he will keep showing up. He can't help but show up. It's in his nature to show up. David said, if I make my bed in hell, he will find me there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace and he showed up. Daniel was in the lion's den and he showed up. Moses was in front of the Red Sea, Red sea in front of him. Pharaoh's army behind him and he showed up. Jesus was in the grave for three days and he showed up. And if he showed up for Daniel, if he showed up for the Hebrew boys, if he showed up for Moses, if he showed up for Jesus, he will show up for you. And I want to pause and talk to somebody that's dealing with some emotional angst, some anxiety, some concern, some consternation, some worry, and some wonder. I got a word for you. If God didn't keep you out, it's because God's on his way in. Change, church. Talk back to me. I said if God doesn't keep you out of it, it means God's going to get in there with you. Is that not what happened with the Hebrew boys? Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace and said, didn't we put three men in there? They said, yes, you did. He said, but I see four. And the fourth one looks like the son of God. Is there anybody that can look back over your life and say, God didn't keep me out of it, but he jumped in there with me. He is not just the God who came, he's the God who comes. And I've got two words for you. He's coming. I know you're hurting, but he's coming. And I know you're confused, but he's coming. And I know you're, you're sad, but he's coming. And I know your heart's broken, but he's coming. And the Advent season is a season of intentional appreciation. I don't even have time to deal with that. We're going to talk about that next week because sometimes appreciation has to be intentional. It becomes a discipline, not a feeling. David said, I command my soul <laughs> to bless the law. Right? So, 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 so this is a season where we should be intentionally appreciative. But, but here it is. And we, but but, but I, I can't stop at just celebrating that there was an advent. That, that it, it, we wouldn't be faithful to our calling as a church. I wouldn't be faithful to my calling as a pastor because the fact that he came is inspiring and we need inspiration. The fact that he came is encouraging. We need encouragement. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in Hebrews 3.13 that we should be encouraging one another daily. So encouragement is essential. It's not incorrect, but if that's all you do, it's incomplete. You see, the name of our church is not encouragement church. And I hope you feel encouraged. But we aren't just called at this church to inspiration. At this church, we're called also to transformation. Change, church. And so because we're called to transformation, we can't just stop at why that, that Jesus came. We need to ask another question. Why did he come? What does that mean for me? How does it impact my life today? I know he came 2,023 years ago, but after I'm saved. What does this mean for me? Here it is for my note takers. Jesus came down so that we could come up. Wait a minute. What, what do you mean? This is what I mean. The advent or the incarnation of Jesus is an introduction to the possibility of greater. Hmm. I'm going to say that one more time. The advent of Jesus is an introduction to the possibility of greater. Jesus, who is the ultimate embodiment and expression of godliness, introduces us 
to a possibility called greater. In other words, when Jesus comes and things remain the same, we miss the point. Stay with me. Stay with me. And, and, and I think this can, can be connected to, this can, can be connected to uh, one of the words that is used to describe the character and the nature of God. See, historically, we have focused on the goodness of God. And yes, God is good. You need to be convinced of his goodness. You need to be persuaded of his goodness. But there's another word that is used to describe God more than good. As a matter of fact, it's a word that's used to describe him 57 times in the Bible. He's not just called good. He's called great. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 25, it says, For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 6 says, Shout aloud and sing for joy, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Psalms 47, 2 says, For the Lord most high is awesome, a great king over all the earth. Why is this important for me? Because you and I are made in the image and likeness of God. So if all you see is your God being good, that's all you'll ever strive for. Where is my 1130? I said, if all you see in God is good, that's all you'll see in yourself. But when you realize you've been made in his image and his likeness, and you get a revelation that he's not just good, he's also just great. Now you begin to see not just God differently, you begin to see yourself differently, and you begin to say like John said, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Somebody say great. great. And Jesus is, Jesus is coming to people. Historically, he comes to people who were doing better than they used to do. But he was like, I'm trying to move you into great, but you're in love with good. I'm going to say that one more time. <laughs> He's saying, I'm trying to move you into great, but you are in love with good. And Jesus is saying, my incarnation is an introduction to the possibility of greater. And this invitation to greater is more than an invitation. It's a responsibility. I'm going to say that one more time. An invitation is optional, but a responsibility is necessary. And you and I have a responsibility to accept Jesus' invitation to greatness. Did you hear what I just said? Because, watch this, watch this. Because, because God has called and commissioned you and I to be people of distinction. Now, here it is. Are y'all okay at the 11th? Are you okay? Wave at me. You still with me? Wave at me. Okay. Here it is. Here it is. And if you were to ask the average follower of Jesus, how are we distinct? They're going to say in our goodness. I'm about to see how real this service is right here. We would say, you know, in, in, in our goodness, holy. And I'm not saying ethics are unimportant. Ethics are important. But truth be told, our greatest area of distinction is not in our goodness because the body of Christ is being sanctified. God is still walking us through. Where am I real? Some of the same... It See, here it is. Some of us have more restraint, but that doesn't mean you don't have the same want to. Come on now. You want it to say some stuff to some people that people who don't follow Jesus say to people. Come on and talk to me. We're the honest people who say it's not that I don't want to do something. See, deliverance is not always absence of desire. Deliverance is desire management. Did you hear what I just said? 
I said deliverance is desire management. It's saying I want to tell you everything I want to tell you, but I've got spiritual restraint, so I'm going to keep myself from doing what I want to do. So some of us, in some seasons, struggle with some of the same stuff. So should we evolve into ethical distinction? Yes, but that doesn't really happen until we get deep in the process of sanctification. So then where is the distinction, family? The Bible's called us to be distinct. Here it is in Exodus chapter number 8, verse number 22. Israel is in Egypt, and all of these plagues are plaguing Egypt. And God says this to Moses regarding his people. He says, but on that day I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live and no swarms of flies will be there so that you will know that I the Lord am in this land you missed your opportunity to shout I'm gonna give it to you one more time but on that day I will deal differently with the land of Goshen God says to Moses there's a plague of an infestation of flies that's gonna be all in Egypt but the one part of town that Israel lives in called Goshen. I'm gonna make sure that the flies fly over Goshen. He says, just because it happened to everybody else doesn't mean it's going to happen. You didn't hear what I said. Doesn't mean it's going to happen to you. Watch what he says. He says, I will, verse 23, I will make a distinction between your people and my people. Why? Go back to verse 22. So that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. He says, I'm going to make a distinction, not just for my people, but I'm going to make a distinction so that other people can see how I ride for my people. Did you hear what I just said? He says, I want everybody to know that this is how I ride for my people. He's he's called us to be people of distinction. But, But what if the distinction isn't really in our goodness? Because even when I'm reading the Bible, I'm looking at New Testament churches, I'm like, all the stuff Paul is dealing with as an apostolic leader is all sorts of stuff that's happening in the world. So the distinction can't just be in our goodness because God's sanctifying us. What if the distinction is not in our goodness only, but also in our greatness? What's greatness? Our contribution. What do you mean by contribution? Here's the word the Bible uses, used to describe it, love. Love, biblically, is not a feeling. Agape is not a feeling. Eros is a feeling. Agape, not a feeling. Got me? Eros is a feeling. Agape is not a feeling. Let me go to this. I feel real. I felt real when I... I'm looking for the real section at the 1130. It's a feeling. Agape is not a feeling. It's an unconquerable benevolence. It's a benevolence, a goodness to people that refuses to be conquered by their lack of goodness to you. That's agape. Agape says that the way I handle you It's going to be based on the way God has handled me. So I'm going to do for you what God did for me, and that is give you what you don't deserve. (laughs) 
So, so what, what, if, what if our distinction isn't just in our goodness? What if we are obsessed with the wrong thing? What if we missed what Jesus actually said? What if, it, what if in an attempt to treat holiness or t- to take holiness seriously, we have given it a place of preeminence and priority that Jesus didn't? I'm not saying, listen to me, because some of y'all listen to me. I'm not saying it's not important. I am saying, have you made it more important than something that Jesus put ahead of it? Y'all not ready for this. Here it is. Here it is. Jesus said, let me tell you what Jesus said. I'm going to tell you what Jesus said. By this, John 13, shall all men know that you are my disciples that you have a love for one another. What is love? It's contribution because when they ask Jesus, hey, what does it mean to love your neighbor? Jesus gives a parable in Luke 10 called the Good Samaritan. And he shows how the Good Samaritan actually contributes to the upward mobility of another person. And Jesus says, that's love in action. Say, your feelings for me don't change nothing if you don't do nothing. Let me go to this side. I'm coming back to the real side. Y'all feeling real? Let me, let me go right here. I said your feelings for me don't change anything if you don't do anything. Everybody in a relationship should have been saying amen right there. Don't just tell me how you feel about me. Show me. I need somebody that's not scared to stand up and sit back down and say, show me, show me. Show me. You the best thing that ever happened to me. Show me. You the love of my life. Show me. I'm not saved because God had feelings. I'm saved because God made a contribution. He said, I'm the apple of his eye. That didn't save me. He said, I'm beloved. That didn't save me. He said, I'm a royal priesthood. That didn't save me. What saved me was his actions. Your greatness, your contribution. Not just your goodness, your ethics, but how are you contributing to it? Like, I, I want to live ethically for me. I want to live ethically because it's just smart. It just makes sense. It's like you want to work this hard so God do everything in your life so you can blow it. It's just smart. Does that make sense? So I want to live at, But me managing my life ethically doesn't necessarily improve yours practically. It's the contribution that I make to you that actually improves your life. So God's calling you to greatness because of the contribution you should make. Watch this. In Genesis, y'all all right? This is the 1130 service. I got time today cuz. I got time today cuz. All right, chair number one be like, listen, PD, don't be here. I got you. I got you. I just, I got seven minutes. Calm down. Here it is. In Genesis chapter 12, verse number 2, I got an example of this. God says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Come on, let's read it so y'all won't say I'm twisting it. Let's just read it. God says, I will make your Abraham name great. God didn't say, Abraham, I need you to make mine great. He said, I'm going to make yours great. And I'm going to make yours great because I'm going to use your name. So when people meet me in the future who don't know who I am, when people, <laughs> when people who are in a polytheistic culture, poly mean many theistic gods, when they're in a culture where it's sun gods and moon gods and fertility gods and environmental gods, and I say there's a God, they're going to want to know what God. He said, I'm going to tell them I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm going to say, you know Abraham who I blew up from the flow up? I did that. You know Isaac? I did that. You know Jacob? 
I did that. I want to know, is there anybody here who say, I want to move from just using God's name. I want God to be able to use my name. I want God to be able to say, you see what happened in their life? I did that. You see how they got there? I did that. It was not by might. It was not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I don't know who I'm talking to, but for the rooms you try to get in, God's got to do it. For the doors you want to open, God's got to do it. For the money you're trying to make, God's got to do it. For the impact you're trying to make, God's got to do it. And I'm getting ready to prophesy this over somebody's life. He's getting ready to do it. I said he's getting ready to do it. I said he's getting ready to do it. And I would not wait till the battle's over. I got five minutes. I need all five. I need all five. Here it is. <laughs> Here it is. Here it is. Tario, where you at? 15 seconds, and I got the finish. Somebody that believes he's getting ready to do it, go ahead and get the praise out, I feel it. Watch this. This is where the average church stop. People on a, a spiritual high, and they let you leave. But there's something you got to do to put yourself in position for what he's getting ready to do. I care way more about that than how hype church is. Let, let me show you, let me show you, let me show you. I got, y'all just took three of my minutes. I'm taking three back. I got five. Here it is. I'm getting ready to get out of here. You got a responsibility for greatness. Watch this, because God tells Abraham, he says, I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. Listen to me. The degree to which you're able to be a blessing is the degree to which you're willing to pursue greatness. If all you are is good, the only people you can help are people that aren't good. Because people that are good want to learn from people that are great. Am I making sense here? I said people so, so you want to pursue greatness because you have an assignment to, you want an assignment driven life, not an appetite driven life. Appetite, what I want. Assignment, what God wants for me. If, only, if what I want is driving me, then I will stop growing when I get satisfied with where I am. You say, well, I'm good, so I'll stop.
If I'm still making sense, wave at me. Wave at me. If I'm still making sense, here it is. Here it is. Here it is, family. How many, I, I, I want to know how many are serious, serious about taking your responsibility for greatness to another level. Okay. The text teaches us something. I'm going to be teaching you keys on how to do this all month. I'm telling you, we're not pumping no brakes in December. We're not giving you no cute nursery rhymes and Santa Claus stories in December. You got bills and kids and responsibilities that do not go away in December. And the devil not pumping the brakes in December, and we not either. One of the keys, guys, I want you to catch this. One of the keys then to stepping into your greatness here is going to be greater patience. Greatness requires patience. And some people, not yet, son, I need five more. Greatness requires patience. And some people can't be great because they won't be patient. Listen to me. <laughs> they end up mismanaging a previous season of their life. And then when they are not where they want to be or could have been in the season they in now, they try to skip steps and become in this season what you can only be if you didn't mismanage the last one. So now you feel older, but because you didn't do anything in the past to get better, you feel pressure to be what you not. One philosopher put it this way, to be is better than to seem to be. Y'all know, are y'all talking to me here? Yeah. So here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, and we'll talk about this next year because it's our theme for next year, multiply. Um, the Bible says, be fruitful and then multiply. See, some people try to multiply. Where your fruit? You skip the fruit season. You trying to tell me, you can show me how to do something. You ain't done it yet. I believe Jesus can raise me up out of the grave because he got himself up. Greatness requires patience, and an incredible example of this is found in our text here in Luke, guys. This text, this text is littered. The Advent story is littered with the power of patience. I could have talked to you in this Advent story. I have to talk about Elizabeth. I could have talked about Jesus. I could have talked about how in Micah chapter 5, verse number 2, Micah, a minor prophet, prophesied that Bethlehem would be the place where Jesus would be born. He prophesied the place Jesus would be born hundreds of years before, how the birth of Jesus is a fulfillment of hundreds of years of prophecy. They had to wait hundreds of years. Patience. I could talk to you about how Mary got pregnant supernaturally but still had to go nine months. How a supernatural start doesn't exempt you a process. Just because it's a miracle don't mean you get to skip the process. I know you're knowing it, but you can't skip the process. I know God called you, but you can't skip the process. Because what you trying to do requires more than anointing, it requires skill. And it takes time to turn your gift into a skill. Great people aren't just gifted, they skilled. But I, I want to talk to you about Elizabeth because this woman, the Bible says Elizabeth and her husband Zachariah, they couldn't have a child. And the Bible says she got to the point where they were old age. Some sources say they were at least over 60 years old. So they're over 60 years old, and they can't have a child. And one day, Zechariah is just faithfully serving God. And God comes to him through an angel and says, I heard your prayer. I'm going to give you a child. He says, you shall call him John, and his name shall be great. Amen. 
Not too long after that, she get a knock on the door. It's her cousin Mary. Elizabeth over 60. And she just got pregnant. Mary show up, she a teenager. So Elizabeth got to be thinking now, it took me to 60. But she wasn't jealous because what was in her leaped. When what, what was in her leaped when what was in Elizabeth showed up. Elizabeth is probably like, I didn't think it was going to take this long. Why she get it as a teenager? I got to wait till 60. Where's my real people that are honest enough to admit I'm not jealous, but I am confused. Let me go back over here. I said, where are my real people that say I'm not jealous, but sometimes I get confused because I'm looking at what's happening with Mary and I'm wondering why she get it as a teenager. And I got to wait till I'm 60. But the Bible says they leaped because there was connection in their assignment because John the Baptist was to be the forerunner for Jesus. He actually prepared the way for Jesus. So God's like, Mary didn't get it sooner because she was better. You got it later because I could trust you to wait. Because I need John to be born right before Jesus is born. If John is born too early, he's off the scene and can't carry out his assignment. But I trust you to keep being productive even though it's not producing anything. I, I, I'm going to see if the 1130 can handle this. I don't know. But Mary's baby, Jesus, was born by immaculate conception. John was not. Jesus is the only example of immaculate conception in the Bible. Which means Mary didn't have to do what people do to get a baby. But John was not immaculate conception. Which means all those years they had to keep doing what you got to do. Even though it seemed like it's not working. I don't know who can handle this today. The devil wants you to quit and the devil wants you to give up and the devil wants you to stop. But I came to tell you, I'm done now, Terry. Oh, I'm, I'm just got to quit. Patience. They had patience. Listen to me. Patience is an emotion. Patience isn't, you know what? I gotta go. All right, All right let me just say, okay. let, 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 me, let me just show you. Let's juxtapose this couple with another couple in scripture who was old and couldn't have a baby. Abraham and Sarah. They both couldn't have a baby. They both were older. But they responded to their situations two different ways. Zachariah and Elizabeth responded with patience. Abraham and Sarah responded with impatience. <laughs> what did they do? Abraham and Sarah set up an arrangement with Hagar. And they gave birth to Ishmael. Because Ishmael is the fruit of impatience. Here it is. Are y'all okay? Because a lot of times we think if God not in it, it won't produce anything. It will produce something. It's Ishmael though. It's a lot of stuff that worked that God wasn't in. God wasn't in the Tower of Babel. But he said, if I don't stop them from building it, they're going to build it. We think, well, if God not in it, it won't work. Yeah, some stuff you did produce something. You just got to ask yourself, is that Isaac or Ishmael? You call him Boaz, but he might be Ishmael. Because you wouldn't wait. I feel the Holy Ghost... And I'm not, did you hear what I just said? Yeah, you might be calling him Boaz, you might be calling her Ruth, but it might be Ishmael. Because that's what you get 
when you rather have something other than nothing. Play, Tario, play. Is it Ishmael? I don't want Ishmael. I only want Isaac. If it ain't the promise, I don't want it. If it's not God's best for me, I don't want it. I refuse to settle for Ishmael when God promised me Isaac. Play. Patience, listen to me because I'm getting ready to pray this over you and we're gone. Patience. Patience isn't an emotion. It's an attitude. This set me free, guys. I got to share this with you. It set me free. You can play Tario. I'm literally getting ready to pray. We're going to go. It's an attitude. This set me free because I kept trying to fix my feelings. And the Holy Spirit's like, why do you keep trying to fix your feelings? Patience is not a feeling. I said in John and Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it's fruit of the spirit. It's an attitude. Patience is the ability to arrest the impulse to act impatiently while dealing with the frustration of the delay. I want what I want and I want it now. Yeah, I want what I want and I want it now. And I'm tired of acting like I don't want it now. But what patience is, is the ability to arrest the impulse to act unwisely. To say, even though I want it now, I'm not going to behave in a way that's unwise to get it. This is what Alan Loco says. He says, almost every unkind word we've spoken or unwise decision we could have, uh, unwise decision we made could have been avoided or dramatically reduced if we had been more patient. Stop trying to fix feelings. You want what you want. Who don't want it now? I'm hungry, but I don't want it now. I want it now. <laughs> Patience isn't the absence of desire. It's the ability to manage desire wisely. Say, I want this now, but I will not act unwisely to get it. I trust God. And what God is working in you, this is prophetic patience. He working it in you because you don't learn it from a sermon. You learn about patience in a sermon. You learn patience in the wait. And he says, patience has a perfecting work. Let it have its perfecting work. It's perfecting something on the inside of you. God's like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But I'm going to give you a gift that's greater than John. I'm going to give you the gift of patience. You're going to give birth to what you're supposed to give birth to, but I'm going to work something else in you in the meantime. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Mount up on the wings like eagles. Walk and not get weary. They will run and not faint. We've been in church all day. We got to get your kids, them children's workers, wore out right now. But 30 seconds, raise it top. Stay in that receiving posture. Now, may the Lord God bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face of favor to shine up on you. May he be gracious to you. May he protect you. May he provide for you. And above all else, may he grant you peace. 
This is my prayer for your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week. See you next Sunday. Hey, I want to thank you for watching. And I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our streams and any of our videos. All right, if this message bless you, do me a favor, share it with somebody else. I'll see you next time.